So about me, uh, my name is Yao. I'm a programmer at HipCloud. Uh, HipCloud is, we're taking the German word, uh, which means mortgage, into the cloud. So we help uh, real estate developers raise money for their projects, whether it's new buildings, new constructions, or uh, old constructions that they are renewing. Usually uh, when they apply, for their, they apply for their loans, they have very low success rate because they are not ready. And so what our application does is take them from when they decide they want to apply for a loan and prepare them so that we increase their chances of success when they talk to banks from maybe 10% to upwards of 60, 60 and above. So that's what we do. I'm, I'm part of the EMBA learning team. EMBA is not a dead framework. It's not dead. <laughs> if you thought it was dead, it's not. And uh, I usually talk on the Vue.js chat. In Discord, uh, my name is uh, Yalta. You find me a lot in the Vue channel. Uh, this is our hip clown. He's here. Where is he? Where is Tom Ah, uh, there he is. <laughs> but this is this is the this is the humans of hip clown. There's eight of us uh, from different countries, and uh, we only have our uh, two Germans. You have everybody from every continent, I guess. Only Australia is missing. In Asia, maybe. All right. So, uh, what is the Emba Learning Team, and what what are we responsible for? So, it's basically people who are responsible for the official documentation of Emba Emba data. Uh, the Ember CLI. If you know Ember very well, it's it's a complete framework. You have all of Ember or nothing else. It's it's not like Vue where you have you can use Vue without using Vuex or Vue Router. Ember is not that way. You have Ember, you have nothing else, and so uh, that's why it, it has very very little adoption. Uh, we we also write the official guide. If you ever find yourself reading uh, the Ember guide and reading about <coughs> loading data, you you probably read the stuff that I wrote. Uh, Ember has a, an RFC system where if you want a new feature in Ember, you have to write a request for comments and it goes through an approval process and the learning team is responsible for that. We're also partially involved in other non-official learning materials and answer questions in the Ember Slack and Stack Overflow, but it's not as active as Slack. Okay, now that that is out of the way, uh, let's talk about the main thing of the day, which is loading data into single page applications. Uh, why it matters? Because single page applications are not your regular web pages. Uh, they are an ever growing uh, bundle of JavaScript. Uh, it doesn't matter how you load them. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how you load them. It's, it's still going to keep growing. And because they don't refresh, uh, we need to find out how, to, how our app is going to perform so that the browser is not going to present junk to our users. It's all about performance, or so what the Google folks uh, call performance, uh, measured with a real model. Uh, if you're not familiar with a real model, it's a very user-centric uh, performance model, which means that it trades developer experience for user experience. So it says that you should respond to your, your user input or action in less than 15 milliseconds, and if you have any animations, the, it should happen in less than 10 milliseconds. Uh, you should maximize uh, idle time and deliver content and become interactive in less than five seconds. If you use a framework, the first three, RAI, is totally out of your hands. It's, it's out of your control. And the only part you can contribute to is to deliver content and become interactive in five seconds. By the way, I should mention that uh, there's a new JavaScript API that uh, most frameworks are adopting, which is a request either callback for handling uh, passing, handling uh, display all that kind of stuff, uh, and Vue has it in a development branch, it's still not made it into the main branch yet, so hopefully we'll cross our fingers and, and, and see it there, so that it can compete with uh, Glimmer, Ember, and React. Okay, so how do we deliver content and become interactive in, in, in five seconds, especially when we talk about SPAs? Because SPAs have unique constraints. Uh, we download the app, which is the bundle JavaScript, all of it, and it could be big uh, at one time. Okay, you might be saying, no, 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 you don't do that. We use dynamic imports, and also you, you get to the component, also you use it, it's not resolved. Webpack is going to do some code splitting around uh, along broad paths. Uh, there's that code elimination, all that kind of stuff. Sure. But, 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 you still have to download the compiler or the runtime of your library, which is the view library. It, it never goes away, it doesn't change. If you have some dependencies, you have to grab it as well, Vue X, Vue Router, whatever. We also have the problem of uh, front-end routing. What it means is we control most of the things that happens in the browser, and so the browser is usually not aware 
whether or not something has changed or whether or not something has been has been displayed because we take over and then there is no refresh there's no you, you just load once and you continue from there there's no more page load event happening and like i said uh the app continues to grow regardless if you do this the code splitting or dynamic imports as the user continues to get to different parts of your application you, you keep downloading more javascript and you never ship out any one of them so the app keeps growing and it gives it could give the, the, the browser some problem because unlike images where the browser downloads and caches and uses it all the time uh, <coughs> for javascript you download, you pass, you compile, and you execute. Or you don't download, you fetch from cache, you still pass, you compile, and you execute. But, but uh, modern browsers, Chrome for example, they've started caching the compiled JavaScript as well. And so you skip all this step and just execute, which brings it to the same level as, as images. And some frameworks like Glimmer have started uh, not shipping JavaScript down to the browser, but shipping bytecodes so that the browser can skip all these steps and just go straight to the execution. But yeah, JavaScript is, is a bottleneck, and especially for single-page applications. Uh, so as I, as I said over here, uh, most of these things are not up to us, which is a good thing. Uh, the front-end libraries and frameworks help us a lot, but uh, we're still left with how to load data. I mean, if, you, if, if our main attention is on how to make sure that the user is seeing something, or our page is interactive, we want to help the framework as much as possible. Uh, the, the framework gives us hooks all over the place, but some places might not be good to load data from, and some places might be slightly better. So we find out what, where, when, and how to load uh, the data. Again, feel free to stop me to ask questions. These are things that I've observed in my last one month of working with an existing uh, view app, and my challenges with them. And so I might be wrong about some things I say about view or view X. So feel free to stop me and correct me, or to ask me a question, and I'll, I'll explain further. <coughs> okay, so as someone coming from, from Ember Data, uh, some of the things that I have expected always from uh, data loading or handling data is, first of all, schema definition. If you're a Mongo fan, you, you probably don't, don't like schemas, but uh, if you use any SQL-based uh, database, like Postgres or MySQL, you definitely are a fan of schemas. And, they shouldn't be restricted to the back end only. We can bring them onto the front end and see how far that goes. And how to fetch fresh copies of the of, of a certain data retrieved from cache, or how about we can optionally update stuff that is already cached. And we do that in the background so that the app can continue doing what it has to do. And do we have the option of injecting data? So uh, schema definition, if, if, if this were about data, you have something like this, where you define a model, and the model has all sort of attributes that. The point of all this is, it, the point of all this is, uh, it gives us one place where we can enforce some kind of integrity. That if I'm ever fetching a person model, um, I know for sure that it has these attributes. Uh, full name is computer, which means it's not stored in the database. It's just me on the front end trying to, trying to do something like this. Uh, so far, I haven't found anything for view or view X that is similar to that. Uh, I think the closest I found was something like view resource, but view resource is actually an HTTP library. It doesn't allow me to define uh, models so that I can handle things like uh, serialization, deserialization, and how I want them to go about. Um, what, what, what was the name of the library you just talked about? View resource? Yeah. OK. So view resource is something you would use in place of Axios, or use in place of fetch, or use in place of, I don't know, I've, I've only seen Axios on fetch being used a lot in view. Mm -hmm. As, and view resource might, in the background, be using, uh, be using Axios or one of them. But it gives, you, it gives you some of the benefits you get from, from a schema definition of this sort. Because uh, when, you do, when you do this, now if I create a person model, I have, I have methods like save or that kind of stuff that's going to make the API request. So view resource also gives you the same thing. <coughs> you find a resource and then you, you, you attach HTTP methods to some uh, methods you define. So if I call save, do a post request. If I call save, do a put request. If I, if I call create, do all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it, it reads better than uh, the raw stuff you see sometimes with the service classes that we usually see in view. So uh, I, haven't, I haven't found anything of this sort. If you know anything that gets close to it, uh, 
I would, I would really love to know because one problem with filing an application is uh, when you make a request and you're getting a response back, there is no way to ensure that what you're getting is this. It's not, you might see something written in, in the comments somewhere that this is a structure of notification. The notification that you're getting from, from the backend has a structure, but there's nothing that enforces it, okay? And you probably have to write your own transform functions around it. Uh, the benefits of schema definition, of course, is that validation is now tied to the model. So a person model is valid or not valid, uh, very similar to what you have in Rails Phoenix, uh, Laravel. Uh, it's also, it also simulates database constraints because you can set default values, you can do all that, all that kind of stuff, the things you don't want. Uh, serialization, deserialization, I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about this later and how we're doing it with you right now. And, and maybe error handling. Uh, it also helps with code organization for especially large applications because there is one central place you, you look for. Uh, when I want to see what is, what is a request, uh, if, I'm, if I'm sending a request, if I'm trying to save a person model, what, what, what gets sent? And if I get a person model back, uh, what happens? You also get cool things with this, like uh, some state, it allows you to do some state management stuff. Like, if I have a model that has no ID, it means it has not been persisted, and if it's persisted, then it probably has an ID, so all that kind of stuff that you already find in backend frameworks, you can have them on the front end framework as well. This is something I really miss, and I would love to have it back. So, uh, in that sense, the difference between viewers and number data for me is that uh, no need to define data, data schema, uh, but it has its problems, uh, which is that what's the expected response of, of a certain request? How do I serialize my request body consistently? And you choose your own network uh, or transport, like, do you want to use fetch? Go ahead and use it. And the, sometimes the better request response stuff is abstracted behind service classes. So in our code, we have a lot of service classes like project service, notification service, for making all those requests. On the other hand, embed data, yes, you have to define your data schema. And the disadvantage is, is that it adheres to a strict uh, JSON structure. Uh, officially or by default, Ember expects you to use the JSON API format. It's, you can see that JSON API.org slash format, but uh, you can override it and, and choose your own format. And there is a complexity of serializers and adapters. Uh, serializers is, okay, uh, this is not how you, I want you to prepare my request, so you have to override, override, and then it, and, and tell Ember data, this is how I want you to serialize my stuff. Uh, but the advantage of this is that you can do stuff like preload. So if you saw how I define my model, I define that it has, it has many relationships with phone numbers, and so I can do a preload, I can tell Ember data to preload. If I see how the user is behaving, and I might end up going in this direction, you can do a preload, and you don't have to, it's super simple. And then, uh, the network uh, transport lib is embedded in Ember data, so you can't change it. It doesn't affect by default because Ember data supports a lot of browsers. It might change, so you have to use XHR. I think it, it chooses between fetch and XHR. Uh, and you can't use Axios. You can, but that's outside of the Ember data. The moment you step out of it, it's on your own to do what you want. But you don't have to handle any request or response. You just have to use the model stuff. Model that say all that kind of stuff, and then you'll be good. But I don't know, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of not on the fence about this. I think this helps a lot, and I, I would definitely love to have it in view. All right. But uh, view has the advantage of staying thin, you know. You, you cut out a lot of things, and it's up to everybody to do what they want. And so everything is cool as long as I'm getting thinner. I mean, Ember, Ember saves, Ember comes in at a couple of hundred uh, kilobytes um, by default, which the Google folks love to hate on. And view is super small, uh, very small for you. But then you, you understand what, what you're trading off for, for the small size. All right, uh, uh, loading and refreshing the data. This is, this is, this is important. So wh where should it happen? In my experience using a, a view, it turns out that it depends on what you need to fetch. It's not the same, it's not the same with Ember data uh, or React after 16 onwards. And let me show you what uh, the others are doing that view is not. So this is, this is Ember and Ember data, which subscribes to the strict model view controller way of doing things. And so fetching data is centralized. There's only one place you're supposed to fetch data. And if you don't fetch data in that place, you are straight off the, the Ember course. And that is the model hook. And it's constantly in the router. But unfortunately, sometimes people have moved things into the after model and used the after model to fetch relationships. 
Uh, you shouldn't do that. Everything should be fetched in a model, and after model is for validations, all that kind of stuff. Should I continue to? Should I continue the transition? Should I abort it? Uh, fortunately, nobody has used. There's another hook that is called before model, that kind of like before enter, before route enter in 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 view. Fortunately, people don't use that to fetch data. Uh, and even worse, but opinions are changing about this. You can inject the Ember store because it's a service. You can inject it into a component and ask the component to fetch its own data. Kind of works here in the UI, the components fetch their own data. Opinions are changing about this, but yeah. So you are supposed to fetch data in, in, the, in the router. And because that is supposed to happen over there, Ember is able to give you some intermediate and substates. An intermediate state is loaded. And so when the model hook fires and the promise is resolving, it, it transitions to a loading state and hands over control back to you so you can do your own stuff. Sort of like display a spinner that data is loading or, or anything you want to do, it transitions over to you and it's up to you to do what you want. Uh, yeah, model after model. And there's also the error substate, uh, which is if the model hook failed to resolve, Ember tells you that it, it failed to resolve and you can do what you want. But the, the problem with that is sometimes your full page or part of your page is unresponsive and in handling that is kind of cagey. It's a little bit uh, not, too, not too friendly. Uh, also, the Ember, Ember data has, uh, it uses a repository pattern which is similar to Ecto, the Ecto ORM, which is everything is in one store and you have methods like find, find record, find all, peak record, peak all, create record, delete record for interacting with your data. And the good thing about find record is it returns from cache immediately what it has whilst reloading the background, unless you tell it not to reload in the background. Same with uh, find model. If there is something in the cache, it returns it immediately, reloads in the background. If, if, there's, if there's nothing in the cache, it will, it will have to wait. But if you're certain that there's something in the cache and you want it, and you don't want to reload in the background, you can, you can tell find record, uh, don't reload in the background, just give me what you have. Or you can tell find all, Give me what you have going to be in the background, but you have options of peak record and peak all. Uh, create record is for creating a temporary records you have in your browser. It's not saved. What you get over here has methods for saving that's for persistent making network calls, API calls. And then delete record can delete from your current store. It can also delete from your database by making API calls. So in this, in this, in this thing, you have, you have actually some mutations as one and the same because they are mixed in such a way that it, it feels good that uh, when, I, when I'm getting data, I don't have to care about where it's coming from. I know uh, if there's data immediately, I get it. If there's no data, uh, it, will, it will wait until there is data. And it's going to refresh in the background, which means my data is automatically going to refresh. So we have no getters, and the stores method will allow you to go over the wire or return the data you have from the cache. Uh, if you if you watch JSConf 2018, you saw uh, Dan Abramov's uh, demo of React 16 and onwards. It's still under heavy development. They're also going in the same direction as replacing getters with methods actually, so that it passes through the cache. So uh, re request are always going to go through going going to go through a cache with what it, what they have what they call a create fetcher, and it's based a lot on the fiber time slicing thing that they've already built into React. So it essentially introduces a cache, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't use the state, which everybody thought should be the, the center of where information is, so you check if the state has the information before you read it. No, it doesn't. Uh, it introduces a cache, and it, it introduces a, a bunch of things around how the cache works, and it's up to you to choose which one you want. I borrowed uh, these terms from Oracle. Uh, read through, uh, refresh ahead, right behind. It's very similar to what I explained with Ember data. That's how Ember data works. So React is moving in this direction, and Ember has already Ember already has this. So how do we achieve the same thing? As someone coming from Ember, how do I achieve the same thing in view? Uh, unfortunately, for some of these things, you need a lot of help from the framework uh, to do this. And handcrafting is kind of error prone. Uh, you, you're more likely to hurt yourself than to, to, to get anywhere. Uh, one of my challenges that I found uh, with, with Vue, Vuex, was that getters can't trigger, uh, can't trigger actions unless, if, if, you, if, you, if you're staying pure, then you, 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 you don't want your getters to uh, dispatch actions. You want them to be just reading from the state and, and returning, returning them to you. 
and that's that's what we have in our app as well. So if you see our computed uh, attributes on most, our com on most of our components, we have a map getters, and we're just reading from the relevant module and using it in our application, uh, which which exposes us to using our uh, stale data. In towards the end of the towards the end of the presentation, I'll show you some of the things that we've done. Uh, but really, you have two options when it comes to uh, what where to load data. You, you either load it before the route transitions or you load it after the route transition. I mean, in in zero, it's probably a crime to ever load data in the before enter or before route enters. But we, I mean, we all break the rule once in a while. So we have situations where we've actually loaded data in before enter, before route enter, but not all the time. Um, the good thing is that all the hooks in the router fire off before the hooks in the component because if the, if the if one of the uh, hooks in the router refuses to continue the transition, there's no point creating an instance of the of the component and using it. Uh, which means that usually over here you don't have access to the instance, the component instance associated to the route, and so you have to use the hack of passing a callback to next and setting the setting the attributes and then uh, setting the values on it. I don't find that to be elegant, but Sure, it works in some of our situations, and so we have places where we do it before enter, we are loading data, or before enter, we are doing our web socket connections, or that kind of, all those kind of things, which probably is not ideal, but we do it. Uh, the best part is to, to do it after route transition and to use the component hooks. I found out that the only thing that matters, the component hooks that matter is created and mounted. Yeah, they have the double advantage of working whether you're client side or server rendered. Uh, if you're server rendered and you use stuff like before mount, all that kind of stuff, I don't, I think uh, mounted doesn't even work when you, when you server render. It doesn't work over there. And so if you load the in it and your app is server rendered, you're going to have, you're going to show blanks. So usually created, you know, it's, it's trying everywhere. So that's why you want to load your data. And because, because of view style of loading data per component, uh, you can either load in the in the general uh, route com router component and then pass it down to the other components that are using the route, or you can let the components themselves when they are when they are up. You can let them do it. Uh, I found a trick where you can it's it's well documented where uh, you can wait until the whole component tree has rendered before before you, before you continue by using the view next tick. But I, I don't find that to be super super clean. It's hackish in my opinion. So I would rather have each component load their own stuff or have the parent component load the data they need and then pass it down to the presentational components. But I found, I found out that these are the two things that matter. Okay, that, that aside, I, I looked around and, and, and there's many open source uh, view projects uh, where you can learn from and see how they're loading data. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to suffer your head and, and do some some bad things when you can look at pretty good open source uh, real projects and, and what's going on. And, and some of them, for good reason, completely ignore, ignore state. And so what they do is, in the created, they, they have, they have, they have a, a method called fetch data. Usually that's what we call it, fetch data. And as part of the things that fetch data does, it sets the data attributes for the particular component. And so there's no point doing a computer and, and mapping to getters. No getters are used anywhere which means that every time the component is created, you're getting fresh data. For their purposes, it, it works. Uh, some also don't refresh the cache. What, I'm, what I mean by don't refresh the cache is, so long as there is, so long as there is data, the, the, so long as there is data, no actions are triggered again. So you're, you're just getting from the current state and you're using it. So you go, you stay on the app and then you go one, two, three, four, and then you come back one, two, three, four. Many things would have changed, but your app is not fetching any more data. It's just using what it has in the state, which I think is bad. Uh, I've seen this, which is worse in my opinion, that uh, periodic uh, refreshes, periodic uh, fetch from. So periodically, you're, you're updating the state. So you have something like a set timeout, and you call the fetch data every five seconds or every, every 10 seconds, arbitrary time. I would much rather prefer that this thing happens every time someone interacts with the page than to try to keep everything up to date and so I'm firing things off. Uh, in my own app or, or in the app I work on, uh, what some of the things we've done is to, which, which is probably evil, 
no less evil is that we use web sockets to 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 ship things around and to update uh, when new things happen. And so we have this cool web socket plugin. And by the way, it's super easy to develop plugins for Vuex because you, you're going to receive mutations and you can still uh, dispatch actions from 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 the plug from the plugin. And so we we use these plugins to update our state anytime we get new data from the backend, and that keeps it fresh. It works. And, and it works very well, uh, but it it tightly couples the front end to the back end. It's not it's not a, it's not something that you want to you want to do. Another thing that we've done is we we, we push the caching into the into the service objects, but that's there's a problem over there because it's it's if else essentially that if there's value in the cache, promise resolve the value. If there's no uh, value in the cache, then you fetch it. We miss out on the opportunity to 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 reload reload the data even if we get it from cache. So even if the data is in cache, we want to we want to we want to reload in the back end by, for example, not waiting for the promise to resolve. You know you can fire a promise and forget about it and know that the promise is going to resolve and your and your your state is going to be updated. Uh, another hack that uh, this is on a this is on a private uh, branch that I'm working on right now is to cache the action dispatches. It's close to it's close to what I want. Uh, which is that it still stays in the view, view as ecosystem. And, and what happens is anytime, anytime I dispatch any action, the, the, the state has, has a key, has an object or a dictionary, whatever I want to call it, that's, that's called cache. And I store the names of the actions that I have dispatched. And so if I've ever dispatched the action, uh, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm dispatching the action again, I look to see if I've dispatched before. If I've dispatched before, then I don't wait for the promise to resolve. I just immediately return to you what I have in the store while the promise is going on. But if the cache is empty, then I can I can wait for the whole promise to resolve before I return anything to you. It's not it's not it's not supported. Uh, it's 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 everybody and their own poison kind of thing. Uh, but it works and, and, and it works well for for the kind of things I want to do because now I get I get fresh data. Uh, it it also allows me to sort of in the cache I can. For example, set uh, stuff like if the cache has been there for just this amount of time, no point refreshing. But if it's been there for this amount of time, then you have to refresh. But what what I what I wish is that I could when I when when I dispatch an action, pass some sort of uh, attributes to it that says that uh, yes, if there's a cache value returned, if there's no cache value, uh, go over the wire. And and my action by itself would know how to how to handle it. Uh, but I feel like Vuex is still growing. I haven't, and it will change, obviously. Uh, maybe uh, more things will, will be added to it. For example, uh, there's, there's in a PR that is supposed to be merged, but it's still, still not been merged. That allows you to pass extra data, extra data to plugins that are registered with Vuex. And it, it's, it's just an object, and you can pass all sort of data to it, which I think is cool, especially for a WebSocket plugin. So, I think some of these things are going to change and they're going to get better with time. So essentially, what, what I'm looking for right now to avoid all the hackers that I've done is uh, a sweet spot <coughs> between uh, getters and actions. Something close to what I've been working on privately, which is uh, if I dispatch an action, check if the, if the action has been dispatched before. If it has been dispatched before, just retrieve from the getters. If the action has and don't wait for the promise to resolve. But if the if the if the action hasn't been uh, dispatched before, then you wait for the promise to resolve. Uh, unfortunately, I have my bosses here. Or, uh, as I showed you, my company code. Sorry. All right. So that's that's the end of my talk. Uh, my experience the last one month with view and loading data into our application. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm available to answer them. Or if, if there's anything that, if because we are essentially all doing the same thing, if there's anything that I, <coughs> you have that I could I could use to improve my process, very welcome to it. Yes, sir. Can you use Backbone or Spot Jurassic Park? Backbone? Uh, I think I was a kid when Backbone came out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, I I haven't I haven't used Backbone. Is it? Are you talking about Ashkenaz thing? Uh, a long time ago? Yeah, yeah I, haven't, I haven't used it before. But it's also MVC, right?
Exactly. So it kind of provides similar functionality to what the display number data does. Yeah. And um, you can actually use it with view. Cool. So that might be able to, um, to provide a functionality that you're looking for uh, in terms of having a model and enforcing these things and even persisting data in the back end. I think the uh, documentation has some, some examples now to use uh, view with backbone. And you probably will be able, if you still want to use UX, uh, you will probably be able to use the three, uh, three of them together. Cool. You use backbone to, to persist your, your models and get data, and then you use um, uh, UX just to keep the store which represents the, the UI, the, the data which represents the UI. Good to know. Be something to look into. Good to know. Usually, uh, because of my background in Ember, I like to stay close <coughs> to, the, to, the, to the framework that I use or the ecosystem that I use as, as much as possible. And so I try to restrict myself to view and official view stuff because I know those things are not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, I, I'm kind of cautious about relying on something else, usually, really. Uh, not, not because it's bad, but because, because I, I like what is kind of official. And, and if the official thing can get better, of course, then that is the way to go. But I, I will take your suggestion and, and explore it all more. But isn't that both dead? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, it doesn't look like it seems. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, Embark Conf is going on as we speak, so if you if you really want to catch up on something, you can see what's going on over there. It's not it's not dead as it's supposed to. As, <laughs> as it's thought, it's not dead. As yet. It's We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, no more questions about this problem, sir. Thank you. Thank you.